As a business owner, one of the hardest things to do is to stop chasing the shiny things and to focus, to go all in on something. Well, that's what you're going to hear in today's interview. Our guest is Jason Miles, and Jason is well known inside of the educational space of teaching about Shopify on his program called Winning on Shopify. He's a Udemy instructor, but really what led it all was this company called Liberty Jane. And it's really strange. It's a doll clothing company. And I know most of us are thinking, a doll clothing company? Can that actually make sales? Well, yeah, we're talking to the sense of like 50, 60,000 sales a month. So you're going to learn what it's like to be in a business in a strange niche. You're going to hear why he decided to niche down, focus on a specific marketplace, why he took care of the customers, built his brand and became world class and how that really led into all the other avenues. Now, we're going to be talking about the different strategies for winning on Shopify. You're going to learn about building that brand as we talked about. You're going to learn about the life and work balance. But what I really want you to walk away with is understand as an entrepreneur, as Jason has done, he's been able to balance this Liberty Jane business, the Shopify business, the teaching business and all of these things. And on top of that, run a nonprofit of all the people that I've interviewed. This guy has a heart of gold. There's a lot of things that he shares on here. You're gonna to wanna to take some notes and you're gonna to wanna to come along with us for this ride. We're gonna start this interview off with Jason explaining how he made the transition from corporate America to running his own thing. So let's dive into it. Well, there's a funny story related to that actually that sort of started my journey, I think. Um, I, yeah, I was a 20 year nonprofit management guy and I always wanted to be a writer and, um, I had this idea for a book. So I went to our senior VP of marketing and set up a lunch appointment and I, you know, I mean, it, she was like my boss's boss. So it was like a big deal. And, um, uh, we went to lunch and, and I basically pitched her the idea for this book that was totally in support of the organization. I mean, it was, it was really designed to be a, a, you know, productive tool. And I remember she basically sort of just shot it down. And I remember the agony of being in that lunch, being rejected. I could tell she, it was like she had sort of these reasons why it wouldn't work, but I knew it was a great idea. And I remember sitting there thinking, no, I, I can't take that. <laughs> you know, I, I've got to, I've got to, um, you know, I can't do this inside the the organization and so um i started working on my own projects i started a blog called marketing on pinterest.com and started blogging uh just on pinterest which was basically it was a, a tool that we were using to blow up our own uh online sales for my wife's business my wife's little ebay and, and online business and that blog ended up turning into a book deal with mcgraw hill and then a three book deal with mcgraw hill and then um, my teaching and writing and speaking sort of flowed out of that. Um, but it's always been sort of a side thing. I mean, I, I don't consider myself a, you know, a, an author as my primary uh, you know, business effort. I feel like I'm a writer and I bring that trade skill to my online selling efforts. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that must have been really hard yeah. for, from getting that no. And then did your you know, we'll start turning like, okay, maybe there's something on the side I can do so that I can create a, a, another vehicle for me to get out of here. Is that what started happening to you? You know, I, I'm a, I, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur and we, you know, I had this kernel of an idea. So our entrepreneurial story is basically, I had this, I heard about a guy making a thousand dollars a day on the internet in 1998. So that was a long time ago <laughs> now. And then, so I basically had that in my mind for 10 full years from 1998 to 2008, I had this idea like, you know, so every time I, we couldn't afford a vacation or I, I got in trouble at work or, you know, we had to use a credit card because we, you know, we're broke or whatever. I always thought I got to figure out how to sell online. So in 2008, we finally started selling on eBay and that was what really sort of created our entrepreneurial path. And in that course of time, I wasn't sure I would ever stop doing the nonprofit work. And in fact, that we haven't, we have our own charity now. Um, but I definitely knew I wanted a function uh, of control. And, you know, a lot of entrepreneurship is about, you know, 
control and and controlling your destiny and understanding you know long term bulletproof financials and that kind of thing. So that, I mean that was all woven in into it. That was that's twenty years ago now that we had that first idea. You know, yeah, I remember those days. This same when I. Um, really dove all the way in in 2008 online. We're in the same time frame. I know what you're talking about. Um, so you decided eBay was one of those routes to go down. Um, what made you decide doing physical products instead of trying to, you know, teach online or do other stuff? Yeah. Well, you know, I was stuck for that whole period of 10 years from 98 to 2008. I was trying to think of stuff to sell. I just didn't, honestly, I just didn't know what to sell. I was so like, I would just think about like, what about this? What about that? But I didn't know how to make any traction. You know, back then there weren't, there weren't tools for just finding product, you know, Alibaba and that kind of stuff just wasn't, wasn't there. And so I was stuck. So finally, um, my wife was making doll clothes for our daughters and the moms in the brownie troop and the moms at school said, what, where did you find this? It's so amazing. And my wife said, well, I did, I make it. And, it, and uh, so that, I got the idea, well, could we sell this on eBay? And so we started doing her unique designs as eBay auctions. And that was really, it just got us into the business. Um, physical items at first. And then, you know, in 2009, we switched to digitally downloaded patterns. Pixie Fair is our website. We've got about 2,200 uh, patterns um, on that site. And it's basically like an online marketplace for sewing patterns, all digitally downloaded. And and we have classes there and also a membership program, Sewing with Cinnamon. My wife's name is Cinnamon. And um, that's really, you know, ultimately what turned into our, our e-commerce opportunity uh, was the, the digital goods. So, and then, you know, my own personal teaching and, and uh, writing and that kind of stuff is sort of on, so, on the side. So. Okay. So, you know, yeah. we, we just went really big picture. Of, uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no, I totally get it. Like you've, you've got uh, eBay sales, uh, you've got selling things online, um, you've created a marketplace and then uh, being able to teach. I think one of the challenges that often paralyzes entrepreneurs is the amount of options that they had. So you, I would assume that you didn't try and accomplish all of those at one time. Is that right? So totally correct. How did you decide where to put your focus and then walk us through that pathway? Yep. For us, it all started with um, in February 2008 with eBay. And we were all in on eBay for 18 months. And our goal was $1,000 a month in sales. And we hit that goal for 18 months. But what we realized was that, you know, making items and selling them on eBay wasn't a scalable business model. But, we, but for that 18 month period, that was all we focused on was building a brand, building followers, customers, doing, you know, figuring out online sales through eBay. And so that was really the origin for our online effort. And, and I totally agree with you. I think that people can get paralyzed. There's so many shiny ob objects, so many opportunities now um, that people can dabble. Mm -hmm. And dabbling is honestly a huge, huge mistake. Uh, when you're just starting out, you've got to really sink your teeth into something and figure out how to actually do something that at least you can get to work. And whether it's a good business or not, at least you've learned something in that first effort. And for us, that first 18 month period was a lesson in knowing we had a brand that people liked, knowing that we had a product that people liked, but then realizing we didn't have a scalable business. So we corrected course, you know, I mean, we, we shifted to digitally downloaded patterns, sewing patterns. And that became scalable for us. And now we do 50 to 60,000 transactions a month, um, you know, at, at Pixie Fair. So, so I totally agree. You can't dabble. Um, and if you do, it's, it's going to delay having anything scale, mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion. Yeah. So you use the word scale. And I, I think that's a, a really relevant word because oftentimes it's the things that don't scale is how you can get the quickest amount of traction but then yeah. you hit a, a certain threshold. So what yeah. did that threshold look like? Were you guys burning out at 20 hours a day and then you're like, we've got to come up with another solution or what was yeah. that? Yeah, you named it. I mean, we, we basically, you know, so it was funny because when we, we didn't know whether we could sell anything on eBay that was, it was basically, if you, you can go to Liberty Jane or go to Pixie Fair and you can see the type of stuff we sell, uh, digital goods now, but back in the day when we were doing it on eBay, my wife would make something. It would take her a week or two to make something we'd sell it at auction and the auctions, we didn't know if it would work, but it started to, you know, started to work. And I was focused on, you know, getting it 
getting the pricing up. So we would do auctions and they would start going for, you know, 80, 90, hundred dollars. Then we got to $200 and we got to $400 for a single item auction in a 10 day period. So we, so I think our highest auctioned item was $500 and it was easy for me at that point to hit relist on eBay. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> My wife would be like, wait, I can't make this stuff. So, she, you know, she's sewing until midnight totally burned out because this is art that we were selling mm -hmm. and it just wasn't scalable. So then we realized, look, she was after 18 months, she was burned out. And the question was, do we stop it entirely or do we do some type of alternative pivot that keeps us in the game, but in a different way? And ultimately that's what we did was we found a way to make it a digital good. And sewing patterns are, you know, tried and true uh, item, you know, seamstresses hoard fabric and they hoard sewing patterns. And so we fell into that and uh, began to see the value of that almost immediately. Um, yeah. So that, that was really the, the issue was uh, time and also sense. cost of goods and that kind of thing. And obviously, you know, for any of your listeners who've sold digital goods, you know, near zero marginal cost is a magical phrase. And digital goods compared to physical items is just, I mean, I, I liken it to some people who I talked about this, like, like operating your business literally on crack cocaine, you know, in the digital goods, you know, uh, you know, universe versus physical items, which feel just so costly, slow, painful in so many ways. So true. So true. So what made you decide to pivot to these digital assets instead of saying, Hey, you know what, why don't we, why don't we hire a team of yeah. 50 seamstresses and, and yeah. blow this up? Yeah. Well, we, we, we did spend a whole summer. It was the summer of 2009 uh, trying to figure this out. And we really um, debated. I mean, we went back and forth and I got a book, Jim Cockrum. I don't know if you know him. He's an online selling guy. And he had a book called uh, Silent Sales Machine Hiding Inside of eBay. His $5 book. And I got that book. And and one of the things he said is if you can find an audience and, and get them a digital product. Now, his reference point was like info products, you know, yeah. like you know, courses or whatever. But we immediately interpreted that to mean a digital, like a utilitarian digital good, mm -hmm. like a, a sewing pattern, PDF document. And that's how we sort of interpreted his, his thing. And, and of course, we debated whether that would be a good idea or a bad idea. Ultimately, we decided for our business it was a good idea and it, it's proved to be. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that was, that was kind of what went into the journey. That's wonderful. Um, isn't it great how someone can teach uh, a concept that they fully believe, like go down info products, but you interpret it in a different way that caused your business to scale. Yeah. So as a part of your business, one of the things that you do is your heavy emphasis on community yeah. and then heavy emphasis on content. Why is that? what we immediately found was we did have repeat customers and we have customers that have purchased from us. We know them by name for the last 10 years. And so we, we had this tribe of, you know, repeat customers and really realized that we had, um, we had found sort of a, a niche and, you know, a lot of guys say, man, sewing, is that a thing? But I always say, look guys, if you like duck hunting and you're all in on duck hunting or muscle cars, it's just the same. Ladies are sewing or crochet or knitting. They just totally geek out over their thing. And so we knew that. And so um, that really led to the beginnings of um, us rallying a community around our brand and um, really going deep. And then, you know, that community has grown and grown. And um, it even allowed us to start a charity. Actually, it's a sewing related charity on the side as well. And that kind of got me back into my, you know, my charity world. Um, but yeah, we, I think it's, the origin of it really has to do with who our customers are and their commitment to their niche, uh, you know, their hobby uh, that they love. So. You know, I'll echo that. My, my grandma is actually a seamstress. There you and go. So, uh, I, I know what that's like. I know the amount of money that she's spent on machinery and everything else. And as a kid, I hated having to sit in the stores forever being around it, but I, I totally get it. There you go. Yeah. Now, now for you as a, you know, I don't know if you grew up as a seamstress, but you know, nope. you're in a, you're in a heavy, uh, female, <laughs> female audience. Deal. Yeah. yeah. And now you're, you're the, <laughs> the leader of the pack. Has that been difficult? Um, 
So we, did, my wife and I definitely have a dance where she's the, she's the front man for the biz because, you know, it's really her business. Um, but she doesn't want to be in charge of, you know, the, the team. And, and uh, so I get to be like, I remember watching Gold Rush Alaska. I don't know if you watch that show or not, but there was a, the Tony guy, Tony Beats, and he has a plaque over his door and it says, I'm the CEO because my wife said I could be. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of our situation you know i mean it's it's, it's her business uh, we're really growing quickly related to sewing with cinnamon as our uh, membership program um so um but i you know i i support her in the effort and so we we know we we have our roles and responsibilities but it's really her vision that we're executing on but she'll say she would have never started a business without me but i say i was looking for something to sell for 10 years and wouldn't and would have never found it if I hadn't seen her artistry. So she really brings the, the art um, magic to it. And I focus on the brand marketing and you know, that kind of stuff. Isn't marriage amazing? Yeah, man. I mean, I, to me, you know, it's, it, it really is interesting to talk about the dynamic of working as a solopreneur versus a, a you know, married couple working together in business um, versus just having a, a business partner. And in, in my coaching consulting business, winning on Shopify.com, I work with a, a top Amazon seller. His name's Kyle. So I have that business on the side as well, that, that coaching teaching business with Kyle. And uh, so we have a partnership in that regard. But then obviously Cinnamon and I have built the business for the last 10 years together. So I, there's a lot of nuance there. There's a lot of interesting things that work and don't work. And um, you know, a lot of elements to it that are um, you find fascinating over time. Yeah. What's the difference of managing or working within the community of your Shopify and Amazon and Udemy community versus this sewing community? What's the difference between those two? Take us behind the scenes if you can. Well, yeah, sure. So the, the um, core of our business is Pixie Fair is, is a business focused on sewing and it, it's in that niche. And then our charity, So Powerful, is, a, is focused on sewing. And so the, that community is, the, the, I mean, you know, between the charity and the and Pixie Fair, there is no difference. Um, the customer for my Udemy uh, work or my books with McGraw Hill are very, very different. Uh, my three books with McGraw Hill that I wrote, um, Instagram Power, Pinterest Power, and YouTube Marketing Power. When I wrote them, I I was writing, I thought I was writing for the small business owner who wanted to use social to grow their traffic. But the people who read my book were like the social media marketing interns at companies and, you know, like the 22 year old social media yeah. girls who they'd read this book and they're like, who is this guy? He's old. Like, what does he know? <laughs> and when I would go and speak at conferences and stuff, I immediately realized like, these aren't my people. And I, you know, the, the thought occurred to me, I'm speaking to the wrong audience. Yeah. I want to be working with the entrepreneurs, startup people who have a product or have a brand that are passionate about e-commerce focused, um, not just straight social media marketers. And so I had to learn that lesson for my coaching, teaching uh, business. And I learned it the hard way by being stuck in on sort of the wrong audience for a good five-year period, to be honest. Mm, that, that's actually really interesting. And that kind of leads me to thinking about your Shopify. You've really sunk your teeth into the yeah. Shopify path platform. Yeah. And I, I'd say one of the key differentiators is if you're core talking about Amazon and doing um, private labeling, or if you're just even like looking for arbitrage, yep. you're getting that opportunistic customer, but you get someone and you're talking about Shopify. That's typically someone that loves their craft. They want to actually create a business. They're willing to invest on the platform and in the business. Have you found that to be the case? Yeah, it is very interesting, the differences that you find. I mean, I, I think what you find with uh, especially uh, retail arbitrage and people who present the opportunity to sell on Amazon, you're finding uh, students who are hungry for online opportunity and want to learn how to make money online. They hear that as an opportunity. It clicks for them. And they also see people instantly almost getting success. And so it's, there is such a low barrier to entry and, and such an ease of which people can jump into that. It's a good first starting point. I think many of those people realize quickly that's not where they want to live for the long term. 
Mm-hmm. And so they start to say, okay, how can I create a private label brand? Um, you know, how can I find a niche audience, build a you know community? And so then those people are honestly sort of looking for um, my type of training. Uh, you know, Shopify powers the course on, on Udemy that we've been really blessed with. The way this whole thing started was we were on WordPress for a long time and I kept breaking WordPress. I mean, we, you know, we get a lot of traffic and a lot of transactions. So, you know, we'll do 50 to 60,000 transactions a month now. And we've had about 2.5 million downloads from, from Pixie Fair. But when we were in WordPress, I would, it would break all the time. So it was down. It sucked. I mean, I just, I couldn't keep it working. You know? mm-hmm. And so when Shop Up, we heard about Shopify, we made the change um, in uh, June 2013 and it worked perfectly. I mean, it was flawless. It was just like literally, um, it just was a miracle to us how elegant a solution it was for our e-commerce needs. And so I became just like a fanboy for Shopify, you know, but the Shopify people um, in 2014 blogged about us. Uh, they wrote an article. And they put it into their marketing funnel for their online, new online sellers. And it just blew up. Um, the article, you still find it's one of their top articles. Uh, it was entitled, How One Couple's Making $600,000 a Year uh, Selling Digital Goods on Shopify. And I just kept getting all these questions. Like, you know, how does this work? What, you know, how did you do this? Is, it, is this BS? You know, like the people would, would challenge whether it was real or not. So I was kind of defending and, you know, um, explaining. Finally, I said, man, I got to just make a a course on this. So I made a Udemy course um, and it's done really, really well. So that sort of got me into the whole Shopify training, teaching space. I want to totally echo you about going from WordPress to Shopify. I've dealt that with myself. Yeah. Uh, Our e-commerce company, we're on Shopify and it's... It is so much easier. I still yep. remember those early days of internet. And it's like, yeah. you had to wear too many hats. You had to be a developer and a marketer and a manager and everything. 100% agree. That, and that was our experience completely. And so, you know, it was a revelation to us. And we continue to be super happy. I mean, you know, we've scaled our business with Shopify and, and it's done great for us. We're thrilled. Talk to us a little bit about Shopify. I, I imagine, you know, people are coming in and they're saying, okay, hey, I... I I know that this is the the premier platform. I I really want to sink my teeth into it. Are you typically getting people that already have a product idea or what stage are they at? And then walk us through, what are some of those first things that you help people with? Sure. Yeah. So the course that, you know, I put out there two years ago now, uh, Shopify Power, it's on Udemy. It's the number one e-commerce course on Udemy. And um, a lot of the students are um, coming into it. and they've had some online experience. So they've been that kind of retail arbitrage person on Amazon, whatever. And so there's, there's definitely this mind shift that they have to make towards being brand centric and product centric. You know, a lot of even the people who have created private label products or gotten training in that regard for Amazon, you know, my first question to them is what's your brand? And if they have any hesitation in telling me what their brand is or the product is, I know they haven't made the mental shift to being really a brand centric and a product centric person. They're just trying to find an angle for getting sales on Mm -hmm. Amazon. So a lot of the people we work with are sort of on that journey. They're trying to figure out the product and brand strategy. So I also have courses for uh, branding. um, And that's a, that's a big first step. People can get it right and be fine. And then people can really get it wrong. And then you've got to do kind of, you know, um, correct course type training with them. and then we also get a lot of people who are on the journey with Shopify and are looking to fine tune and uh, scale. And so they see uh, our outcomes, they see our results and they say, how are you doing this? You know, how do you, how do you get uh, conversion rates and, you know, um, just sort of scale out of Shopify. And so uh, I have some students who are absolutely fantastic. We have an inner circle program. Uh, it's 19 bucks a month. So it's, you know, it's, um, you know, low barrier to entry. And a lot of people who jump into that are, are really on their way pretty effectively with Shopify, have great unique brands. Um, and so it's fun to work with them on, you know, scaling up their efforts. Sure. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's no real, you know, a lot of people always want like the hacks or the tips or the secrets. Yeah. Um, I personally, you can learn those and then they're gone tomorrow. 
Right. Um, it's it's going to be some fundamentals, principles, um, and then it's the hard work. So, yeah. what are those core fundamentals or principles that that you're focusing on, and that you're saying to people, "Hey, this is this the small group of stuff to focus on." What, what are some of those things? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the the fundamental question is product strategy, and so you know, I, somebody I don't remember who who it was, but somebody said, you know, great brands are built by great products. And so, you know, your product strategy is central to whether you're going to be successful online or not, whether it's on Amazon, eBay, Etsy, or, or Shopify on your own site. So that's the first question is, do you have a product that is not only sellable, but has margin so that you've got net profit and then also is defensible for the long term? And, you know, a lot of people who have just looked for a product on AliExpress or Alibaba or, you know, I have, have found um, so private label, you know, sourcing. Um, haven't really thought through defensible long-term positioning and how to actually build um, a loyal tribe and a process by which you are bulletproof from competition. And so I I spend a lot of time talking about that kind of thing, helping people understand how they can make that happen and really kind of going down um, that path. So product is central. Second thing I always hear from people, which is generally the first question people ask me is, how do you get traffic to your Shopify store? So traffic is, is also, you know, sort of right there as a top of mind issue or concern uh, for students. And so we do with our inner circle program, we have a program called traffic breakthroughs. There's basically nine sources of traffic on the internet. And if you don't understand how to set those up to, you know, create success for yourself, then you just haven't learned about them yet. And you just, you know, somebody has got to just walk through um, them with you and say, okay, here are the sources of traffic. Here's how you set yourself up for success. Um, either through paid or organic methods uh, to, you know, have traffic to your store. And, you know, we, we work with a lot of people on those types of strategies as well. Do you, do you find it that, you know, let's say someone has a unique product. Um, they've, they've got something that they truly believe in, that they've got of good quality. They've got margin. Do you find it often that they just are stuck of, letting people know or they get stuck on focusing on too narrow of an audience. I mean, you know, I'm just going to be the, I'm just going to put this on Instagram and then hope that everything else works. I do see that. Although I wouldn't say that I see people get focused on too narrow of an audience. They might be focused on one platform and they need to have a multi-platform sales strategy. But I don't believe in this day and age, I don't believe you can have a niche focus that's too small. I mean, even the smallest, I mean, that's the beauty of, and the original work by Chris Anderson, um, you know, free the future of a radical price uh, was his, um, you know, interesting book. Um, and you know, the idea that you can find an audience of any variety in the world now, I mean, I, th- I think I heard somewhere there's going to be another billion people added to the internet, like in the next year, you know, and there's still, a, there's still a lot of people who are not online. That's insane. So I don't think you can go too deep into a niche. And I do think that's a way in which to create defensibility. For example, this doll clothing patterns. A lot of people kind of laugh when I say that, but when I, when you're talking about niche positioning, you want to find a niche that is so small that people laugh at you almost. Mm -hmm. Like, seriously, like, that's what you do. I'm like, yeah, because what you want to do is find something that's so small that the big companies are like, no, we're not going to go into that. It's way too, you know, micro. And, and, but then it, but so then you're not competing with mammoth companies. So for example, in our space, um, the, you know, doll clothing patterns, I have to think to myself, I'm, I think it's fair to say I'm competing against a lot of people who are not professional marketers in that category. And so you want to think through these things like, okay, how, you know, how deep can you go anyway? So I do see people who, um, who have traffic problems though. And so the, the question is how do they solve those traffic problems? And so there's a set of strategies we work with people on and, and, and growing. Um, yeah. So can you share a couple of those strategies with our listeners? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we see our students um, find the most success with is uh, contests. And w- so we have a whole training course. You can find it on Udemy, um, but social contests. 
we started our business running um, YouTube contests mm -hmm. in 2008 and found our first attraction and our first tribe with YouTube contests. And then we went on from there. So we run several different types of contests every week on our site. Uh, our whole course for social contests is a, sort of a walkthrough of how to do various types of contests. Um, a lot of people want to run straight ads on Facebook and get traffic to their Shopify site. And the problem is that they can't convert at um, affordable pricing. Yeah. And so, the, so then they think, well, Facebook doesn't work for me. But the issue is they're trying to advertise their product specifically. But what we found is it's much, much, much easier to run a contest and then um, share about it through all of your channels, email, you know, Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, promote it on Facebook. And in that way, the contest acts as a unifying sort of a traffic strategy that you can rinse and repeat. So, and, you know, a lot of people have thought, hey, contests, I've never done that. Maybe I'll do one. And they think, okay, I'll do one. And what we teach people is, no, you do one a week. And you build a system of running contests effectively for your nature industry. And your customers turn into advocates. And they share on all the social platforms about your business. So, honestly, I mean, that's one of our top strategies for uh, traffic-related activities. And we found it to be um, student after student says, hey, I've never tried this. I'm setting up the way you tell me to. And, hey, it worked. You know? <laughs> Yeah, it, it does work. I mean, I, I can attest to that. That's how we built our uh, Instagram for the e-commerce company. There you go. That's how we grew our software company. So I can totally attest to that. What other strategies uh, have you seen that most people would say, oh, really? Like that works? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of guys in particular discount Pinterest. Um, and so I really, you know, I started our, our my, I started my educational content with that blog I mentioned, marketingonpinterest.com because we were having such success with Pinterest and I just wanted to blog about how we were doing it. And so, you know, if you look, for example, at all of the referral traffic on the internet and shareaholic uh, data scientists do the best research on this, but if you look at their stats, they'll do sort of a quarterly check-in. You'll notice that the top four sources of referral traffic on the internet are Google organic search, then direct typing of a URL, then Facebook, but it's massively declining over the last two and a half years. Facebook is referral traffic has been on a massive decline from a top of, I think 26% down to like 18%. The fourth source is, is Pinterest, which surprises a lot of people. And then the other social platforms are literally like fractions of a percent in terms of referral traffic to websites. So we talk a lot about Pinterest. We think it's a huge opportunity for e-commerce sellers. And um, if you don't have a Pinterest strategy in place uh, for any type of physical or in our case, obviously digital products, um, it's the way to go. And it's not just for ladies topics, you know, it's, it's not just fashion. Um, and I think that's a, that's a key lesson. A lot of guys in particular have to break through on. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, I know that that's one of the things we focused on several years ago for the e-commerce company. And there's a lot, there's a lifetime to Pinterest. Yeah. Where your Facebook lifetime yep. has declined yep. rapidly. Whereas like the way we look at our social is we've got YouTube and we've got Pinterest. And those two have the longest lifetime. And YouTube's, I mean, it's always improving. Yeah. Pinterest is one of those things where it's just shocking. That topic you mentioned, I, uh, people refer to it as different things. I call it the the shelf life, uh, shareaholic calls it that. They refer to something as the half life of a socially shared object. And so the, the issue that they're describing is how long does it take to get half of all of the interaction, a comment, a retweet, repin, re whatever, a share, a like, how long does it take it half of that? And on Twitter, you know, it's like, you know, 14 seconds and it's over, the party's over, you know? <laughs> and um, so obviously, as you've just mentioned, the longest like half-life is on YouTube and on Pinterest. Now, the difference between the two is that YouTube has cratered in terms of referral traffic. It does not send people off YouTube. And but Pinterest, by comparison, um, they've described themselves as wanting to send people off of Pinterest. That's like part of their mission. So that's very, very different from YouTube or Facebook, which they want to have a walled garden in which you do not depart. 
And so as an e-commerce marketer, you want to think through that piece. But yeah, I totally agree with you in terms of the, the longevity of the socially shared item. Of course, the other thing that works in that way is blogging too. And blogging you know, has a, a fantastic shelf life in terms of organic search outcomes. You know, it's, it's interesting you broke down those details of YouTube uh, in a decline of them wanting to send people off. Right. Totally true. One of the previous guests that we had on does a lot of YouTube ads. And YouTube's just simply switched. They've gone to the point where they say, hey, look, we'll let you target the audience more, but you're going to have to pay to run those ads. And that's what Facebook's done as well. Yeah. Whereas what you're saying is, hey, look, like there's not much free real estate left, but Pinterest has one of those. And obviously you should be creating content on your blog, building that community. So I want to switch gears for just a sec and understand what is the day in the life of you managing, <laughs> running these companies? Uh, I imagine it's uh, not a pie in the sky of you know, a couple hours a day, like Tim Ferriss would say, but it's also not 20 hours a day. So we'd love to hear what that's like. Sure. Yeah. I'm happy to describe it. Um, For our e-commerce company, Pixie Fair, go, you know, go check that out. Uh, I have gotten to the point where I'm like four hours a week, but obviously like as even Tim Ferriss describes, that doesn't mean you don't do work. (laughs) Basically what that means is it's allowed me to spend a lot of time on two other things. And one is the coaching teaching business, the winning on Shopify.com site, the inner circle there, the one-on-one coaching that we do through that site. And then the other thing is the charity that we run. And I'm spending more and more time on our charity and really passionate about seeing that scale as well. Those, you know, those two other things. So yeah, I, that is sort of how I work in terms of like a weekly schedule. Um, Monday is our charity day. So I have a team of volunteers that, and we have a a office location, um, in our city. We have, you know, um, you know, sort of a formal office and it's in a retail space where we have a retail space in the front, a lady who runs a yarn shop rents it from us. And in the back we do sort of our business and products and stuff like that. And, uh, so we have, um, Mondays for so powerful Tuesdays are our team day for Pixie Fair. And so we have a, t- our team shows up for Tuesday. So b- besides that, they're all working from home, you know, for our, we basically have a one day a week work week um, in the office. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'm doing work from home on my special projects and uh, doing stuff like this, honestly. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and you know, the real challenge for us to be really candid right now is um, my wife and I debate frequently whether we really want to be lifetime life laptop entrepreneurs sorry or have an office and have a whole team all the time and i think for maximum efficiency and productivity we'd probably have an office where we're there nine to five monday through friday but just for lifestyle purposes you know we kind of like being laptop entrepreneurs i understand the world you're in uh for me (laughs) i uh used to live in puerto rico with my family and so We lived right on the beach, yep. uh, worked from home. I've done the office stuff. And, and so I've gone from the lifestyle and I've done the office piece as well of having, you know, devs in office and working and everything like that. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's a struggle. And to build that community, um, I think as an entrepreneur, it's not about, at least I'm speaking for myself and from knowing you, yeah. it's not about greed. It's not about how much more can I make. It really is of understanding the urgency and the scarcity of time and saying, I have this amount of time, how much impact am I going to be able to make and how effective it might be? Is that how you feel as well? Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, so that's, it it is about time. I I always say as well, it's the phrase I like to use is uh, what's the highest and best use of everyone's individual time and energy. And, you know, as a, when you start out, we've been doing this for 10 years now, but as we, and and we continue to grow the team, but as we took the first step to add a, a, you know, freelancer and then an employee, uh, you you know, you're, you're constantly struggling with this idea of what you hand, what do you hand off to other people? And then, you know, what does that leave you with in terms of what to manage or what to do yourself? And so, yeah, I always think of the highest and best use of our time and uh, efficiency. And I think we're, you know, we found, I think that we would never want to be a hundred percent remote virtual team. I think for us, one day a week together um, is, is sort of a good compromise uh, that we're doing for both, uh, you know, 
our Pixie Fair team and our, our charity team. So, yeah. How wonderful. So it's really interesting. We've, we've gone full circle uh, in this conversation today. We've talked about where you started going with eBay. Uh, you made this pivot and you started selling digital products. And then to be able to build the community and to continue to educate, created content. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, I actually understand this stuff. So you started teaching on Udemy. And then you've gone and you now have membership programs, both in the craft business and in the we'll call it marketing business. Yeah. Yeah. So you're continuing to grow and to thrive. What do you find to be the biggest constraint that you're trying to overcome right now? Well, that's a great question. If I'm being super candid, it's probably my own management ability or inability. You know, and as soon as you start to get a team of people, you start to quickly realize it comes down to your ability to lead people and effectively manage, have roles, responsibilities. And, um, I think that's a constant struggle for me personally and something I'm working on. You know, I want to be a good manager. I want to rally people. I want to see people flourish and, and really thrive in our team system and take ownership and responsibility, not be a micromanager, not be a jerk and be somebody who leads a group of people who are a wrecking crew. You know, I mean, like just a, a squad of elite, you know, killers to use a negative connotation, but you know, so that that's the real thing that I think about is how are we building a team and is it working? Um, and I think that's the biggest struggle. And um, it, it's one of those things that you, I'm not sure you ever master it. You, you just learn, you know, as you go. Please don't ask me that question because my answer is <laughs> the same. I'm trying, I, I as well, I'm, I'm trying to navigate that management role. And I, I think for a lot of people, and I'm only speaking from my experience of sitting at the kitchen table and building a Shopify store and then growing the Shopify store and, and seeking out manufacturers to do our own products. And we're not talking private label garbage. I mean, real stuff. Yeah. Um, and I'm not trying to discount private label by any means, but I get it. I get it. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, there's always that, I don't know if you call it a ceiling, but you hit a barrier and you're like, man, I just wish, I knew what that next step is. Right. Um, so for our audience, um, my call to action to you as a listener is to go check out winning on Shopify.com. Uh, see what he has. The barrier to entry is like ridiculously low. And then other things is you can just go to Udemy. You can search um, Jason's name yeah. and see the quality of the courses. Like they're killer quality. Absolutely. Of you know, it's, it's great stuff. Um, I personally have purchased your courses with my own money. So it's not like you gifted. I didn't know that. Yes. Oh man. Now I feel like, oh man. Okay, cool. No, I, I per personally did. And I had my team like, I was like, hey, these are things that we have to implement. Awesome. Um, so it's, it's that sincere of my call to action to you guys. Um, one thing I want to finalize with is what should I have asked you that we didn't talk about? Um, oh, that's a great question. Uh, wait, wait. Well, it's obviously, it's your show, man. So you ask me whatever you want. But um, one thing that I, um, I'm passionate about personally, and that's making a difference. And, you know, I, when we sell a doll clothes pattern, a lot of people would say, well, man, are you changing the world with that? But actually, actually, yeah, we, we actually started a, a program in Lusaka, Zambia, and uh, have a charity that we're super passionate about. And here's the important thing, and here's how it ties to the entrepreneur and um, business builder. Um, one of the things that we really learned, and I had a nonprofit background, but one of the things we've really learned is to the extent that we started to clarify how we could be helpful to, in our case, a community in Lusaka, Zambia, and share that story and journey, and it was honest. I mean, it was from our hearts our followers and fans and customers really, really got enthusiastic about us and our mission. It, in essence, in, in terms of branding as a principle, think of it like this. You have a logo, you have a tagline, you have like a, a purpose for your brand. When you introduce the idea of a charitable mission, you really unlock a new facet for prospective customers to lock onto. Uh, in terms of understanding who you are and your heart, motivation, that kind of thing. So 
So there's altruism is it in it and really a passion for making a difference, but there's also a logic to it in terms of us as entrepreneurs. So I would just say to your audience, find something that you are personally passionate about that makes a difference in the world and weave it into the story of your online selling and your e-commerce, and you'll find customers click with you over that topic in interesting ways. So I love that topic anyway. I mean, you know, to the extent that that's enough of, about it, yeah. but ho hopefully that helps a little bit for somebody who's really also passionate about, you know, changing the world and that kind of thing too. Man, that's wonderful. Uh, how can our listeners follow up and say thank you, or maybe even ask you questions if, if that's something you want to do? Yeah, winning on Shopify.com is the best place, um, as you mentioned, and we've got blog articles there. Uh, we, we do a Facebook live session every week that then we post there. And so we're on Facebook as well for, um, you know, winning on Shopify. And we'd love to connect. Uh, hit me up anytime. I'm Facebook message me, uh, Jason Miles on Facebook, and feel free to, to uh, connect with me. I love working with people. I think we have over 12,000 students wow. now through the Udemy program. And that's, I love doing it. I mean, it's, I love learning about people's business. I want to ask you more questions about your Shopify business and experience when we're done here. Uh, because I'm just, I'm a fan of entrepreneurship and fan of online selling and love to see people succeed with it. And uh, awesome. yeah, so anyway, feel free to connect with me any, in any way. I'm happy to hear from people. Awesome. Well, thanks for spending the time with us today. And uh, listeners again, go to winningonshopify.com. I hope you liked this interview. What I want to do is give you a free month to winning on Shopify. So listen up. Here's how it's going to work. So what I want you to do as a listener is make sure that you give a shout out, share this episode, let people know about it. Also check out his site, Winning on Shopify. Now what we're going to do is we're going to run a little contest because that's what Jason talked about. And this contest is one of the first business growth contests that we've done. And here's how it's going to work. If you share this episode and leave a review, let us know over the next 30 days from the published date. We're going to pick one winner and that winner is going to get a free month of the winning on Shopify course. Now I am paying for that out of my pocket. Jason doesn't know about this and I'm not an affiliate. I'm not compensated. This is just my way of saying thank you and hooking you up as a listener so that you can go and learn even more and then we can pay it forward for Jason. So for all our new listeners, you can jump in on this too. Again, 30 days from the published date. Go out, share, we'll pick a winner, and it's on me for your first month of winning on Shopify. Make sure you smash that subscribe button, hit follow, and let people know about the Business Growth Podcast. Thank you for spending time with us again today.